William Booth, born April the 10th, 1829, died August 20th, 1912. The authoritative life of General William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army, by C.S. Railton, first commissioner to General Booth, with a prefix by General Cromwell Booth, copyright 1912. Prefix. I have no hesitation in commending this small volume, as containing so far as its space permits, a good picture of my beloved father and a record of much that made his life of interest and importance to the world. It does not, of course, profess to cover anything like the whole story of his many years of worldwide service. It could not do so. For any such complete history, we must wait for that later production, which may, I hope, be possible before very long when there has been time to go through fully the masses of diaries, letters, and other papers he has left behind him. It must not be supposed that I can make myself responsible for every phase Commissioner Railton has used. I know, however, that perhaps no one except myself had anything like his opportunity during the last 40 years of knowing and studying my father's life both in public and private, and of understanding his thoughts and purposes. Now, we wish this book to accomplish something. We cannot think it possible for anyone, especially a Salvationist, to read it without being compelled ever and anon to ask himself such questions as these. Am I living a life that is at all like this life? Am I at any rate willing by God's grace to do anything I can in the same direction, in order that God may be more loved and glorified, and that my fellow men may be raised to a more godlike and happy service. After all, is there not something better for me than money making, or the search after human applause, or indeed the pursuit of God, earthly good of any kind? If, instead of aiming at that which will all fade away, I turn my attention to making the best, of my life for God and for others. May I not also accomplish something that will afford my satisfaction at last and bear reflection in the world to come? I hope also that to some at least the great message of this life will stand revealed in these pages. I believe it to be that while God can do little or nothing by us until we are completely submitted and given up to Him, He can work wonders of infinite moment into to the world when we are asked a few months before his death if he would put into a sentence the secret as he saw it of all the blessings which he which had attended him during his seventy years of service the general replied well if i am to put it into one sentence i would say that i made up my mind that god almighty should have all there was of william booth it was in the beginning that entire devotion to god and its continued making would which could alone account for the story told in these brief records. The book is, of course, written in the main from the Salvationist point of view. Much of it, indeed, is simply a reproduction of my father's own sayings and writing to his own people. This, to all thoughtful readers, must be our defense against any appearance of self-glorification or any omission to refer to the work in the world that others are doing for Christ. No attempt has been made to tell the story of the general's life and time, but simply to note some of the things he said and did himself. And I trust the record may be found useful by all the many servants of God who do not think exactly as he thought, but who yet rejoice in the triumphs of the cross through his labors. To continue and to amplify the results of his work must need to be my continual aim. I am full of hope that this book may bring me some help not only towards his memorial scheme, which contemplates the erection and equipment in London and other capitals of enlarging premises for the training of officers in every branch of the work, or where they already have such buildings, the erection of new headquarters or halls, but towards maintenance and extension in every land of the work he began. It cannot but be a special gratification to me to know 
that this book will be received with eager affection in, in almost every part of the world. How could it ever cease to be my greatest joy to strive more and more after my father's ideal of linking together men and women of every land and race in one grand competition for the extinction of selfishness by the enlistment of all sorts and conditions of men in one great holy war for God and for all that is good? Whether those into whose hands this volume falls agree or not with the teaching of the Salvation Army, may God grant them grace to join heartily at least in this, my Father's great purpose, and so help me to obtain the victory for which it has been died. W. Bramwell Booth, London International Headquarters of the Salvation Army, November 1912. End of the prefix. The Authoritative Life of General William Booth, Chapter 1, Childhood and Poverty. William Booth was born in Nottingham, England, on April the 10th, 1829, and was left, at 13, the only son of a widowed and impoverished mother. His father had been one of those builders of houses who so rapidly rose in those days to wealth, but who, largely employing borrowed capital, often found themselves in any time of general scarcity reduced to poverty. I glory in the fact that the general's ancestry has never been traced, so far as I know, beyond his grandfather. I will venture to say, however, that his forefathers fought with desperation against somebody at least a thousand years ago. Fighting is an invenerated habit of ours in England, and another renowned general has just been recommending all young men to learn to shoot. The constant joy and pride with which our general always spoke of his mother is a tribute to her excellency, as well as the best possible record of his own earliest days. Of her, he wrote, in 1893, I had a good mother, so good she has ever appeared to me, that I have often said that all I knew of her life seemed a striking contradiction of the doctrine of human depravity. In my youth, I fully accepted that doctrine, and I do not deny it now, that my patient, self-sacrificing mother always appeared to me an exception to the rule. I loved my mother from infancy to manhood. I lived in her. Home was not home to me without her. I do not remember any single act of willful disobedience to her wishes. When my father died, I was so passionately attached to my mother that I can recollect that, deeply though I felt his loss, my grief was all but forbidden by the thought that it was not my mother who had been taken from me. And yet, one of the regrets that has followed me to the present hour is that I did not sufficiently value the treasure while I possessed it and that I did not, with sufficient tenderness and sympathy at the time, attempt the impossible task of repaying the immeasurable debt I owed her to that mother's love. She was certainly one of the most unselfish beings it had been my lot to come into contact with. Never mind me, was the descriptive of her whole life at every time, and in every place, and under every circumstance. To make others happy was the end of all her thoughts and aims with regard not only to her children, but to her domestics, and indeed to all who came within her influence. To remove misery was her delight. No beggar went empty-handed from her door. The sorrows of any poor wretch were certain of her commiseration and of a helping hand in their removal so far as she had ability. The children of misfortune were sure of her piety, and the children of misconduct she pitied almost the more, because, for one reason, they were the cause of sorrow to those who had reason to mourn on their account. For many years before she died, love, joy, and peace reigned in her heart, beamed from her countenance, and spoke 
in her words. Her faith was immovably fixed on him, who was able to save to the utmost. It was a common expression of confidence with her that Jesus would go with her all the way through the journey of life, even to the end. He would not leave her if he were on the rock. To this testimony is his mother's work, the journal added. To those whose eyes may fall on these lines, may I not be excused saying, See to it that you honor your father and your mother, not only that your days may be long in the land, but that you may not, in after years, be disturbed by useless longing to have back again the precious ones who so ceasingly and unselfishly toiled with heart and brain for your profound well-being. My mother and father were both Devonshire people. They were born within a few miles of each other. The former at uh, Summer Coat Hut, a small village within a mile or two of Al Freighton, and the later at Belper. My mother's father was a well to do farmer. Her mother died when she was three years of age. When her father married, married again, she was taken to the heart and home of a kind uh, aunt and uncle who re- reared and educated her, giving her at the same time a sound religious training. Years past of which we have but imperfect knowledge during which, by some means, she drifted to the small town of Ash by the La Zouch, Z-O-U-C-H. Here she met my father, who was availing himself of the waters as a remedy for his chronic a- enemy, a rheumatism. He offered her marriage. She refused. He left the town indignant, but returned to renew his proposal which she ultimately accepted. Their marriage followed. Up to this date, her path through life had been comparatively a smooth one, but from this hour onward, through, through many long and painful years, it was crowned with difficulties and anxieties. My father's fortunes appear to have begun to wane soon after his marriage. At that time, he would have passed, I suppose, for a rich man, according to to the estimates of riches in those days. But bad times came, and very bad times they were, such as we know little about, despite all the grumbling of this modern era. Nottingham, where the family was then located, suffered heavily a large portion of its poor classes being reduced to the verge of starvation. My father, who had invested the entire savings of his lifetime in his small house property was seriously affected by those calamities circumstances. In fact, he was ruined. The brave way in which my mother stood by his side during that dark and sorrowful season is indelibly written on my memory. She shared his every anxiety, advised him in all his business perplexities, and upheld his spirit as crash followed crash, and one piece of property after another went overboard. Years of heavy affliction followed, during which she was his tender, untiring nurse, comforting and upholding his spirit unto death. And then she stood out all alone to fight the battles of his children amidst the wreck of his fortunes. Those days were gloomy indeed, and the wonder now is looking back upon them is that she survived them. It would have seemed a perfectly natural thing if she had died of a broken heart and been borne away to lie in my father's grave. But she had reasons for living. The children bound her to earth, and for our sake she toiled on with unswerving devotion and unintermitting care. After a time the waters found a smoother channel so far as this world's troubles were concerned, and her days were ended in her 85th year in comparative with peace. During one of my motor campaigns to Nottingham, the general wrote on another occasion, my car took me over the Trent, the dear old river along whose banks I used to wander in my boyhood days, sometimes pouring over young night thoughts, reading Henry Kirky White's poems, or as was frequently the case before my conversion, with a fishing rod in my hand. In those days, angling was my favorite sport. I have sat down on those banks many a summer morning at five o'clock, although I rarely caught anything, 
My old uncle ironically used to have a plate with an afghan on it, ready for my catch, waiting for me on my return. And then the motor brought us to the ancient village of Wilford, with its lovely old avenues of elms fringing the river. There were the fairy meadows in which we children used to revel amongst the bluebells and crocuses, which in those days spread out the beautiful carpet in springtime. So the unspeakable delight to the unspeakable delight of the youngsters from the town. But how changed the scene? Most of these rural charms had fled, and in their places were collieries and factories and machine shops, and streets upon streets of houses for the employees of the growing town. We were only 60,000 in my boyhood, whereas the citizens of Nottingham today number 250,000. A few years ago, the city conferred its freedom upon me as a mark of appreciation and esteem. To God be all the glory that he had helped his poor boy to live for him, and made even his former enemies to honor him. But we all know what sort of influences exist in a city that is at once the capital of a county and a commercial center. The homes of the wealthy and comfortable are found at no great distance from the dwelling of the poor, while in the huge marketplaces are exhibitions weekly of all the contrasts between town and country life, between the extremest wants and the most lavish plenty. Seventy years ago, life in such a city was nearly as different from what it is today as the life of today in an American state capital is from that of a Chinese town. Between the small cities of old families, who still possessed widespread influence, and the masses of the people there was a wide gap. The few respectable charities generally due to the piety of some long-departed citizen marked out very strikingly a certain number of those who were considered deserving poor, and helped to make every one less concerned about all the rest. For all the many thousands struggling day and night, to keep themselves and those dependent upon them from starvation, there was little or no peace. It was just their lot, and they were taught to consider it their duty to be content with it, to envy their re richer neighbors, to convey anything they possessed was a sign that would only ensure for the carpenter an eternal and aggravated continuancy of his present thirst. In the describing those early years, the general said, before my father's death, I had been apprenticed by his wish. I was very young, only 13 years of age, but he could not afford to keep me longer at school, and so out into the world I must go. This event was followed by the formation of companionships whose influence was anything but beneficial. I went downhill morally, and the consequences might have been serious, if not eternally disastrous but that the hand of God was laid on me in a very remarkable manner. I had scarcely any income as an apprentice, and it was so hard up when my father died that I could do next to nothing to assist my dear mother and sisters, which was the cause of no humiliation in grief. The system of apprenticeship in those days generally bound a lad for six or seven years. During this time, he received little or no wages, and was required to slave from early morning to late evening upon the supposition that he was being taught the business, which, if he had a good master, was probably true. I, it was a severe but useful time of learning. My master was a Unitarian, that is, he did not believe Christ was the Son of God and the Savior of the world, but only the best of teachers. Yet so little had he learned of him that his heaven consisted in making money, strutting about with his gay wife, and regaling himself with worldly amusement. At nineteen, the weary years of my apprenticeship came to an end. I had done my six years' service and was heartily glad to be free from the humiliating bondage that had proved I tried hard to find some kind of labor that would give me more liberty to carry out the aggressive ideas which I had, but by this time come to entertain, as to saving the loss, but I failed. For twelve months I waited, 
Those months were among the most desolate of my life. No one took the slightest interest in me. Failing to find employment in Nottingham, I had to move away. I was low, very low, to leave my dear widowed mother in my native town, but I was compelled to do so and to come to London. In the great city, I felt myself unutterably alone. I did not know a soul except a brother-in-law with whom I had not a particular of communion. In many respects, my new master very closely resembled the old one. In one particular, however, he differed from him very materially, and that was he made a great profession of religion. He believed in the divinity of Jesus Christ and in the church of which he was a member, but seemed to be utterly ignorant of either the theory or practice of experimental uh, godliness. To the spiritual interests of the dead world around him, he was as indifferent as were the vicious crowds themselves, whom he so heartily despised. All he seemed to me to want was to make money, and all he seemed to want me for was to help him in the sort of self task. So it was work, 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 morning, noon, and night. I was practically a white slave, being only allowed my liberty on Sundays, and an hour or two one night in the week, and even then the rule was, home by ten o'clock, or the door will be locked against you. This law was originally enforced in my case, although my employer knew that I traveled long distances preaching the gospel, in which he and his wife professed so loudly to believe. To get home in time many a Sunday night, I have had to run long distances after walking for miles and preaching twice during the day. The contrast between those days and ours can hardly be realized by any of us now. We may put down almost in figure some of the businesses that steam and electricity have made, linking all mankind together more closely than Nottingham was then connected to London. But what words can convey any picture of the development of intelligence and sympathy that makes an occurrence in a London back street of interest the reading inhabitants of Germany, America, or Australia, as intense as those of our own country, what a consolation it would have been to the apprentice lad, could he have known how all his daily drudgery was fitting him to understand, to comfort, and to help the toiling masses of every race and clime. In the wonderful providence of God, all the, these changes have been allowed to leave England in as dominating a position as she held when William Booth was born, if not to enhance her greatness and power, far as some may consider beyond what she deserved, and yet all the time with or without our choice, our own activities and even our faults and neglects have been helping other peoples, some of them born on our soil, to become our rivals in everything. Happily, the multiplication of plans of its course is now merging the whole human race so much into one community that one may hope yet to see the dawn of that fraternity of peoples which may end the present prospects of wars unparalleled in the past. How very much William Booth has contributed to bring that universal brotherhood about this book may suffice to him. End of chapter one have been read by Peter John Parisi.